And this happened with it like within minutes actually. Like you had these two rays which happened very fast. And if one part of the island rised, on the other side, it went down. And that's what we call subsidence. So on the other side of a similar island, we lost about 50 centimeter. Sorry, could you spell that? Sorry? It's written here. The name of the island. Oh, Simulu. S I M E U. There is a C M L U H. I got confused all the time anyway. And that's a difficult part when we work, work on tsunami because you have some, it's moving, it has moved so much that it's very difficult to find benchmarks to have an idea of where are the areas that have been eroded or the areas have been like um, following subsidence, subsidence went down. It's very difficult to, like, to make sense on which process has been working at which scale and where because it's all mixing. You have like erosion that bring down the level but you also can have subsidence at the same time, or it can rise at the same time. And it makes things like quite difficult actually when you're in the field. Like for instance here, this is Bandache before, with the, the harbor there. And this is after. And obviously, you have erosion that happened due to the tsunami. If you go back, before, after, you can see that a lot of stuff here, the coastline has disappeared. But at the same time, we have measured subsidence, that the all land also went down. And that's one of the cases where it's difficult to attribute the disparition of some features, geomorphologic features, to either one process or another, knowing that it's a combination of both. But when you look in details, which one have been act acting where is like really difficult. And we have also some proof that the old city has been thinking, thinking, S I, ne, not TH, thinking progressively. Like if you look in your arbor and you like go and dive, you can find the 13th century Muslim uh, cemetery, which is uh, under like five or six meters of water. So, like from the 13th century, to the 20th century, we have lost at least five or six meters in the area. And the question is how? Is it like progressive? Or do we have um, previous events like this tsunami or a large earthquake that has brought down the old town? So at, when you're doing geomorphology, you have to be careful in the sense that what you're measuring, what you're looking at, is not the result of one punctual event, but it has to be like put into history, into long time history. Um, another example is like in Kaju. Kaju is an area which is just <coughs> south of Banda Ache. We are looking for the deposits and looking at it while I'm cutting the crap um, about this uh, tsunami. And digging down, we found another tsunami deposit, way, way older. And what was like interesting that it, inside this tsunami deposit that were just sand layers, we could also find meteoritic material like from outer space. And digging a bit more, we could find also in the center of the Indian Ocean like a huge crater like created by a meteorite about 5,000 years ago. And both dating were coinciding. So like the idea is like that like this meteorite went down in the Indian Ocean, created the tsunami, a tsunami that brought this material uh, to the shore. And like for the story, like just to finish it, and if you look at Madagascar, about 250 meters above sea level, we can find the same deposits. And the idea is like that since it's not so old, there is no subsidence that which it has been acting about 250 meters. Like this large tsunami created by the meteorite 
may have created a wave that rolls about 250 meter on land, inland, sorry, um, on Madagascar. And we may have had the same kind of patterns on Sumatra Island as well. All right? So that you have those kind of different elements, events in the past as well, that are constructing your landscape. And so that when you work on one element, one event, and you're like digging down to go and have an idea of what happened, you have to be careful not to mix previous ev events and new events, and you have to make sure that you put all this in perspective. And this is true for your like, studies as well. And this is true for the assignment I gave you as well. When you're going to give me results, you have to put it in perspective as well. Okay? <coughs> so here, what do you think? Subsidence or inundation? Erosion. We vote erosion. We vote subsidence. Yeah, we have one winner. It was like difficult to tell anyway. But what happened is like the this all the flat here just went down this way and inclined itself so that the water go get trapped behind. And at the limit with the hills around, you have like small faults and it's all going down when the hills are not moving. All right? Makes sense? You have the ba basically this area, this flat area here, which is like just tipping over. And these are the problems, these are the problems that we had when we went there. Like, how do we make the difference between erosion or subsidence? And how do we do it? What do you think? What's the tool? Geologist. Yeah, the, the geologist is like us, he's going there and he's like, hmm, yeah. But what is he using? Or what can we use? What did we use actually to have an idea? GPS. GPS can be useful if we, um, the GPS is going to tell you that your surface change, but it's not going to tell you why. Why is it tipping? Is it really tipping or is the back of it being eroded? Well, there's still vegetation, so it could have been eroded there. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, very true. But what we do usually is like we use geoelectric. It's like a long cord, electric cord, so that we can see. We send electric signal in, inside the ground, and so that we can see the different layers that are below, and we can see if they have moved or not. If you are doing geology, you're going to see that, I guess, very soon. They have one also in geology. You can go and play with it. <coughs> Again, subsidence. Uh, here are the trees. At first, they were, their roots were not in the water. Those guys usually grow on dry land. And that was quite a lot, actually. The other the effects, subsidence, uplift, is soil liquefaction. Well, I used to explain blah, 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 but I think I don't have to explain to you anything about soil liquefaction. You all know about it. You have been dugging it, shov shoveling it, I guess, in Christchurch. So that you know exactly what happens. And in extreme events, when you have like those kind of buildings here, you can have a building can just like fall over because like the liquefaction is like going to be like, the ground is going to be very like soft and it's not going to sustain the weight of the building anymore. Um, the second element which made it an exceptional tsunami was the propagation at sea. It reached about 130, uh, 835 kilometers on open seas per hour, sorry. That's the speed. And it's slow down close to the coast. Um, and you can observe it, have an idea, feel of it, when you look at this map, seeing that actually it went very fast on open sea. And when you look at um, the lines close to the coast, you can see that it was like way slower. And I guess if the animation is working, yeah. And this you can see as well. You're going to see at the back of Madagascar, it's going to be way, way, way slower. If, 
Nein, ist bei GameStop. No. Did you see any videos of uh, the tsunami in Bandache? Can you remember they were talking about this cobra shape wave that was coming on land? You know why a cobra shape, right? It's like really a well-formed wave. When you look at the videos from Japan, could you see that? No. Like, do you have any idea why? Why it's two very, two different, two very different waves? At least in their shape. Is it the depth of the coast before the depth of the seafloor? Yeah, that's very close. It deals with that. Proximity. So, not, not the proximity. The shape of the seafloor. Yeah, exactly. When in Bandache you have a very specific configuration so that the seafloor and the continent continental shelf are almost aligned and they are going up like in a straight line. So that at no point there is, uh, there is any break. So the wave has just been forming and forming and going inland and still forming. When you look at Japan, on top of the fact that they have wave breaker at sea to stop the tsunami waves, to break the tsunami waves. They're like large walls that they put in the sea, more or less. The continental shelf is just like doing one step. So when the wave arrives, it's going to break at this point, and it's going to be more turbulent, and it won't have this nice cobra shape that people described in uh, Banda Aceh. And we'll see it next week, I guess. It has also a lot of impacts on the type of destruction and where the destruction, destruction were um, in Banda Aceh compared to Japan. And it's going to impact as well. This is what we're going to see now. The wave hates. So how did we measure it? Well, it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> We try to find anything which is still standing. And here we measured the scorched trees until which height the trees were scorched by the wave. What kind of information does it give us here? Minimum height or maximum height for the wave? Maximum. maximum. Minimum? Yeah, I like the minimum. Why? Because it applies, it implies, sorry, that the wave has been scorching and like eroding more or less the tree. But it doesn't mean that the water didn't come on top of it without harming the tree. If you could take a bucket of water, just spray it to your tree, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to scorch the tree. We agree? And what has scorched the tree more or less? Certainly all the debris taken at sea and carried by the wave. And there is a great chance that for the top layer, the top part of the wave, there were not so much, so much debris inside. They tend to be like at the base. All right? So the top one, top level, may not have scorched the trees. And what we have here are certainly minimum. And to get more precise data, we have worked on building, because what can we see on building is like the upper limits of the water. Can you see it here on this one? It's very, very difficult, but have a good look at it. Can you see the main dome of the moss in the center? When the shape is curving on top, you have a change in color. And this is actually the, mini, the maximum level of water. And do you have any idea of the size of this building? How tall is it? In, uh, in meta, more or less. 30 meters? Yeah, exactly. Like the top of there, the water reached there, 35 meter. <coughs> and give you some idea when you compare the 15 meter up to 20 meter in Japan, and here again, the 35 meter.